Folks, uh, thank you very much for joining us today for uh, what I think will prove to be a very interesting seminar, or I should say a webinar, uh, with two guests with uh, tremendous experience in the whole topic of stakeholder capitalism and the issues underlying uh, a movement that aims to create or enhance uh, returns for investors by creating value for employees, customers, supply chain and distribution partners, and communities in the environment. Leo E. Strine Jr. is a former Delaware Chief Justice and an early advocate for the principles of stakeholder capitalism and public benefits corporations. He is currently of counsel in the corporate department at Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz. And anybody who knows corporate law knows that that is uh, one of the best known uh, uh, corporate law firms in the world. Uh, we're also uh, very happy to have, um, for his always unique uh, and informed perspective, Larry Bieferman. He's a consultant and a fellow on labor and work life at the Harvard Law School. And again, is somebody who's steeped in, in the whole movement of valuing worker voice, worker input. And so what we're going to be discussing today in the next hour, we have a that's a lot of time with two people of this level of expertise. So we're going to really get into this. What's, why is this controversy about stakeholder capitalism? Let's just quickly go over the definition of what's creating such a stir. Uh, and will U.S. companies have to comply? We're going to discuss with the new EU uh, European Union regulations that require uh, companies that um, have to comply with 250 or more employees to disclose such information as their turnover, which is not something companies like to disclose. We're going to talk about something that Leo has talked for years about, the extra E and ESG and the B Corp, uh, the Public Benefits Corporation. And we'll get into stakeholder rights and governance. And can a board be sued for poor people management? And finally, the state of stakeholder capitalism today. So we've got a lot to cover. And I always do want to, for one moment, uh, thank the companies that help our organization. Actually, we're really about helping them. But in helping them, they help all of you by supporting the creation of content and shows like this that help your business. And please remember, we have lots of free resources for you. Never have to belong. Uh, we're about stakeholder capitalism. and We share a tremendous amount of resources. So I'm going to stop this share and we're going to get right into it. Leo, thank you so much for joining us. You've been following this. How have stakeholder capitalism become such a debated subject? Uh, um, is there a definition other than creating value through people that has gotten everybody so upset? And where did that come from? I mean, Bruce, it's actually been a longstanding debate. I think right now is a particularly rancorous time. But I think there's always been this push and pull, which is when you form a for profit business, is its sole end just the best interest of your stockholders? Or can a for-profit business um, pursue broader ends? Uh, for example, we want to make a profit, but we want to make sure that we're respectful to all of our stakeholders, which is sort of how I would term stakeholder kind of capitalism, which is that you make money the right way through the respectful treatment of your stakeholders. But there's always been this push and pull because you're taking other investors money bruce and as public companies emerged and became a big factor in our economy if you look back in the 1960s people like on the on the right milton friedman and and other members of the conservative kind of movement were concerned about ceos being in line with the new deal and the great society they were concerned about corporations forming foundations and using their money to influence society and then on the left were people like ralph nader who had didn't believe business people were representative of their interest and were concerned about corporate power influencing the political process in a way that was harmful to workers or the environment or consumers and so there's always been this kind of push pull and you know one thing in the U.S. that I think to keep in mind is that a majority of American states have so-called constituency statutes, Bruce, that say that boards can actually pursue um, the best interest of their stakeholders along with their stockholders. And even in Delaware, it's been long understood that as long as there's a rational relationship to the best interest of your stockholders, that you can be other regarding towards workers, towards the communities that you operate, you can make charitable contributions. And you have a duty under basic American corporate law 
to only conduct lawful business by lawful means. And when you get outside the U.S., Bruce, it's much more common for the mandate of corporate law to say that you're supposed to make money the right way and you're supposed to treat all stakeholders respectfully. But within corporate law, and this is united throughout the world, even in places where workers have some voice, stockholders have the biggest influence over companies because they're the one who elect the board. Well, and so there's always right there, Leo, because we're going to get yeah. through that in one moment. And I so hold it. And Larry, I want to ask you, right to related to this, please. I have trouble understanding how an organization can do well unless it is engaging its workers, unless it's engaging its customers and its supply chain and its communities, and it's operating in an environment and where everybody is healthy. So, Larry, you've been really an advocate for worker voice here for decades, probably. Why is it that we have to argue this point that it's actually better business to have prosperous stakeholders? Uh, well, I, I guess it's I think the issue is going from the general to from the particular. Uh, that is broad sweeping statements to that effect uh, uh, go down relatively easily. Uh, but the, the question is, what, what, what happens? What happens in practice? And uh, in some measure, what happens in practice depends on uh, uh, how people exercise their power and uh, uh, the pushback to that power. Well, and, and right, Larry, can I just, just to jump in here? Please. Feudalism, it existed for a long time. And it was quite profitable for the overlords. We had slavery in this country. We've had industries in this country, Larry, I mean, Bruce and Larry, that have made money for generations, if not hundreds of years, and not been good to workers. So it is the case that there are many companies that have a model of shared success, where their workforce is treated well, and their stockholders benefit accordingly. But the rules of the game matter. And part of what we overcame, part of what the New Deal and European social democracy was about, was about having fair, stable rules of the game, so you have the dynamism of a market economy, but it's fair to the people most important to creating wealth, and that's the workers. But historically, Bruce, it is the case that people have been able to profit off of the sweat of other people. And, you know, it, it took actually enlightened regulation and societal movements to make it unacceptable, for example, to employ ch children. And, and and I think one of the things we're, we're talking about is remembering those that is, those historical developments and making sure that we actually align our market dynamics with the best interest of all of us. Well, to both of you, I'll ask the question, though. Isn't it OK? I can make money hurting people, no question. But what if I can make more money by making people prosperous? For instance, we have a case study here, and I'll ask you both, total quality management. Back in the 1980s, we were burying high levels of defects into manufacturing. We just accepted it. It was fine. We, shareholders were happy. And then the Japanese came along and they said, no, we're going to be strategic and systematic. We're going to involve our employees, right, Larry, in the whole process of continuous improvement. And what happened? The Japanese whipped our butts. We've never recovered ever recovered from what the Japanese did to the auto market. Isn't, my argument would be, and I'll ask you both, is, isn't this, if an organization has a clear stated purpose and it views all of its stakeholders as critical to that, because I don't know how you can achieve a purpose without your stakeholders, I don't see how it's a, a risk to shareholders to invest in those stakeholders. Aren't we really just accepting the fact that companies bury high levels of of disengaged people into their business models like we did quality? That is a question. Aren't we accepting a high no, level? No, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think when you look at it, if we look at who, if we look at what we really want from our investments, right? Most of us don't invest in one company, Bruce, right? We invest in many companies. Most of us, have as part of our portfolio, not just equity, but debt in those companies as in the form of bonds and other things, right? When you get in retirement, you, you can't just do in equities. When you save for college for your kid, your portfolio, when the kid gets to high school is going to be more in bonds. We need 
We need, therefore, corp companies not to go bankrupt. And most, for most of us, our access to a good job is really the most important part of our portfolio. And we pay taxes. And the externalities and the cost of, of externalities come to us. So what we really want is what I call making comp have companies make money the right way, which is money net of externalities, create real value. And where they, they improve, it's because of things you're talking about with the Japanese system, which is improvements in quality, improvements in efficiency that are, are real, not shifting wealth from um, active workers to uh, shareholders or from debt holders to shareholders or from, frankly, from society to shareholders in the form of we have to do the environmental cleanups or if you look at the opioid crisis, right? All the dollars that went into those excess opioid sales have probably caused a negative multiplier to society in terms of wealth. So and I think we buried that, that cost. We don't Yes, see and that's cost. what I'm saying. Is, and we don't even have a good... Net. One of my big to-do things is that we've never had a good measure of what a company really creates in terms of wealth because we don't actually price the externalities. And even more, a company with an 8% return to equity might have create more wealth for society than a company with a 10% return to equity if the company with an 8% return pays a quality wage to all of its employees and all the workers in its, in its supply chain because the overall wealth for society, every for all things being equal, an extra dollar into workers' pockets is gonna be better for all of us because it's gonna have more positive distributional effects. It's more likely to create a positive multiplier effect in the economy. And what, but what we have to do, deal with is the economy we have. And it's, there's always been a part of the market system that's about people trying to get more than their fair share. We've got powerful institutional investors and their incentives are not always aligned with the people whose money they hold. And so to make what we all know is the most rational approach, which is that we should focus on making money the right way, which is money net of externalities, making the system oriented in that direction, Bruce, is, is frankly, you know, fairly complex to endeavor. Well, total quality management, you know, I think is a greater uh, model than one might think, but that's not the focus today. But Larry, do you have any observations before we move on as to why this has really become, because everything Leo says to me makes sense. It's just better business. It's not about, you know, a company being forced to, do to donate money to causes it makes no difference to. But like the great and late John D. Rockefeller, he believed in all of his employees being healthy. So he invested in their housing. He never had a strike. I do not believe John Rockefeller have ever had a strike. OK, and he's a controversial man. So, Leo, before we move on, I'm, I should say, Larry, I'm sorry. Any, do you want to make any comments of how something so common sense has become so controversial? I don't think anybody advocates for CEOs to give money to causes unrelated to their mission. Do you have anything to say on this, Larry, before we move on? Uh, that, that particular, but let me just step back. Good. Uh, I mean, harking back to what Leo was referring to before, I mean, uh, <clears throat> you, you had 50 years ago or 60 years ago, uh, the uh, positive effects of a regulatory regime with regard to workers, NLRA, Fair Labor Standards Act, all, all, you know, all, all, a whole set of a government imposed requirements uh, that in a way responded to the concerns about outcomes for various st stakeholders. What I would suggest in, in a sense that we're having the current conversation framed in the terms that it is, okay, and which is focused sort of in, in a sense internally to companies is because of the pushback on that regulatory regime. That is, and arguably it's failures. That is, if one can attribute a whole bunch of ills to the pushback over 50 years, not that, not that there's every single regulation been pushed back, but, but in terms of the limits on government gov being able to uh, facilitate uh, uh, benefits to stakeholders outside of the what they immediately get from companies, okay, the only response, the only viable response at this point, it would seem, it was perceived to be, is in effect, to uh, either one, one way or another to spur companies to rethink how they do things. 
in turn, and it just illustrates, seems to be, for example, the people get to the PBGCs. In, in a sense, if if the the task is done. I'm not, I'm take a step back. I'm not saying that a greater regulatory regime is not required, but holding that aside, that is, insofar as there are limitations to that, and the focus, quote, has to be, I like saying internally to companies. The question is how to spur them to do that, and and experiment with modalities. The Pension Benefit Corporation is one such modality. Be worth exploring whether it does that and how, or if there are other models. Also you mean that. a profits? Uh, you mean a? Uh, you don't mean a, a public benefits corporation? You oh, meant. Public we'll benefit. And we're going to get to that in a minute. So oh. thank you because that's exactly the big question. Does Bruce, can I make, make a point? I think part of what Please. Larry's saying is is basically what you've had is as as globalization affected us, right? I mean, people. You, it's great that you mentioned the Japanese because many people forget that before the Chinese were considered an economic threat, the Japanese and, and, and others were. You, the U.S. approach to globalization was very different than Japan and Germany. Japan and Germany engaged in gain sharing between stockholders and workers. We embraced the, we had President Reagan won, and we went in a, in a direction where the power of, of workers went down and the power of stockholders and markets went way up. And inequality grew. When inequality grows, you get people subject to nativist appeal. Economic insecurity uh, played a big role in the rise of fascism and communism, right? And we were lucky in this nation to have Roosevelt take an enlightened approach with the New Deal that became a model. And what, what Larry is saying is as that is eroded, people have felt more insecurity. What's also happened is because the business sector in this country is allowed to act on government, there's been huge increases in corporate political spending. There's been the, frankly, the judiciary striking down key protections for workers, for the environment. Um, and so there's been pressure put on the corporate sector. That pressure has produced what's been called, called the ESG movement, which we can get through the nomenclature, but becomes associated with companies doing better by the environment. More recently, doing something about workers things like diversity, equity, inclusion. Why has there been a blowback? Well, because it's lapsed not into necessarily, as you know, Bruce, into how companies treat their own workers or the environment itself. Companies have found themselves enmeshed in things like reproductive rights. Um, what sort of voting procedures should states have? Where are you on you know, things like the North Carolina bathroom law? gun rights. These are very controversial our issues, right, about which there's, I have my own strong views um, about them. You probably do. I know Larry does. But there's no consensus in the American public, and they don't have an intrinsic relationship to a lot of the companies. <laughs> and, 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 and so this idea of, of Bruce, what we've been talking about is, I call it making money the right way, has sort of been lumped together with this other idea of whether companies should get involved Thank in you. controversial issues of public policy. And this is all made more complicated by the fact that companies have become, after Citizens United, have become a huge player in the corporate uh, political, in this uh, political donation space and give hundreds of millions of dollars. And now you've so got to stop right there because I want to ask you about this. You, uh, Leo, the bottom line is, um, they, it's, you beautifully answered the question. The idea of stakeholder capitalism got conflated after the business round table and Black Lives Matter happening at one time. And I mean, the business round table, uh, obviously the, the reshaping of the charter of the organization of the stakeholders uh, came at the same time as BLM. And that got seized upon as CEOs getting involved in politics. And they did, i.e. Disney. So I'm going to ask you now, doesn't it really make sense for, for CEOs to stay out of politics, except that it relates to the welfare of their stakeholders? Shouldn't we not be donating to politicians unless it is specifically related? Shouldn't we not get involved with just say gay? I may be totally opposed to what happened in Florida, but 
I have 40% of my employees, as you've pointed out, that are gung ho. You brought it up. Where should CEOs be in politics? I, I mean, I think, I think one of the things I think is, is that companies as companies have more than a CEO. And so the boards need to be more involved. I think that I have no problem with the CEO saying, I don't believe in discrimination. I, 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 I don't like that and that's not the way we behave as a company and we as a company are relentlessly attempted to be non-discriminatory i think the more difficult thing is if you're going to say we're not going to do business in an entire american state because of this because there's a whole bunch of your employees who work in that state who don't agree with the state policy you're proposing and the other difficulty is as bruce you pointed out, is the ceo speaks out and says i don't like this law and then they look at this, the company has given tens of millions of dollars to the very legislators who passed the law. And what I'm saying is if companies measure themselves primarily by how they treat their employees, which is, are they open to employees of all races, of all sexual orientations and preferences? Is it a tolerant, harassment-free workforce? Do you pay a living wage? Are the communities where you operate better off? Do you give to the charities there? Do you have safe, non-polluting uh, facilities? Are your products um, safe and fit for purpose and make your consumers better off? That's hard to do, but that's the real test of being a quality business and paying your taxes so that the school systems where kids go to school have, are, uh, are, get, get your fair share of taxes. That if, if you do those things, there's not really a left-right divide about those things. That it's when you start saying we are a company where we have a particular perspective, you know, on on guns or on other things where people start saying, well, what, who elected you to do that? What is your comparative advantage? Are your stockholders are as likely to have disagreements about those as the American public? So is your workforce. And it starts intrinsically getting divisive. And, and I think what we need to separate out, that's why Bruce and what we've been talking about is, if you mean ESG in the sense of environmental, social, and governance, that you have policies that are enlightened and where you make money only through the respectful treatment of everybody who you affect. You're respectful to your consumers, your communities of operations, and your workers. And you try to walk the walk of a good employer and citizen and pay your taxes and be responsible. If that's the definition, you don't have a lot of divisiveness. It's if you start, though, having the companies have to take policy positions about legitimate subjects of societal debate and companies using their funds that haven't been given them to their purposes to elect particular candidates to support particular committees. That's when people start saying, well, who gave you this money? And what ends up happening is Democrats and people of the left look at companies like a Hobby Lobby or a Chick-fil-A that may have certain views that they don't agree with and say, well, who are you to do this? And then people on, on, on the right look at companies that have taken positions on guns or, or things like that and say, well, who elected you to take this? And the, the actually what Ralph Nader and, and Milton Friedman would kind of agreed on is that nobody elected any of you to be the deciders on those issues. And I think what I'm saying is it's not a perfect solution is get out of politics, leave your politics to your stockholders, your customers, the human beings, focus on being a good business. That's hard enough. And if you actually do that, You'll probably bring out the better angels in society's nature because you'll set an example that's positive, but you'll also probably reduce the controversy because you'll be welcoming Americans of all kinds to do business with you and work for you. Oh, Again, it's Larry, not perfect. Leo. You know, Leo, this is a fantastic, Larry. Uh, I'll be a little, I mean, I'll be a a little contra. I'll be a little contra. Good, a good. A try cynical though. My, I, my guess is that Leo knows, knows these co companies far better than. Uh, uh, my slightly cynical view is a, depending on uh, on context, uh, it's like selling a brand, establishing a, a brand, one's one's uh, one's image, um, and I'll say advertising writ large 
is to is to not focus on a product, but create associations of that product with other attributes that people, God love motherhood, apple pie, and what have you, make that association. So my my intuition is at least in part, some of these decisions are related to branding and on sure. balance, particular constituencies, whether particularly customers. There, there are customers and there are customers. They're not, they're not appealing to everybody. Uh, I don't know. And second, to some degree, they're workers. Maybe if they're younger workers and they want to appeal more to younger workers. All I'm saying is it seems to me at least part of the drivers are that, that it's wise, that it was thoughtful and makes sense in the long run is an entirely different issue. But, but the, sister, problem part the, of the, the problem with the problem is, I think, is and that. The pro yeah, I know. I agree with you. But I think pro the problem with it is that unless you match your situational response with real thought and follow through, then you increase skepticism and 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 you create an impression of hypocrisy. And what's happened when people have popped off because they see a situational outrage, then it turns out that the the very legislators who passed the law that supposedly outraged the company, received tens of millions of dollars from the company, right? Then you end up with the people who don't like which, how you responded situationally, they don't think you have legitimacy to speak to it. And then the people who you actually, you, you agree with them, they're looking at going, yeah, but what was more meaningful? The one day ad in the New York Times or the $10 million that you gave to the committee that passed all these laws? And, and I think what I'm saying and, and what Bruce is trying to say is that there's a good concept here that's actually pretty much a consensus by throughout, you know, the OECD nations, which is that, yes, you, you have to be profitable to be a successful company. Nobody denies that. In fact, no worker, workers of, uh, in particular, want to work for successful companies. And we, so we want you to profit, but we don't want you to profit at the expense of others. We want you to profit after doing right by the others whose conduct you affect. That when you put it that way, that is what creates real value. And that's, by the way, what puts competition on the footing that creates the most innovation and wealth, because it's on quality, it's on ingenuity, it's on real efficiency, it's not on shortcuts. And I, as a guy who's like, can't wait to watch the other Leo at two, is knows if you have a referee in a game, Larry, right? And he doesn't enforce the rules and is erratic, that the people on the field don't get more, more civil toward each other. They don't behave more in accordance with the way the game should be played. They see, oh, you can hack down a player and you can get away with it. And pretty much soon, everybody, instead of focusing on playing the game the right way, in the way that we enjoy, you're watching people just foul each other right and left. And in I have business, to interrupt you again. I'm so sorry yeah. because we've got time here. And I did want to say one thing, Larry, um, about what yeah. you said. Nike is a great example of a company that has a clear purpose. And so they did take a stand. And I think, Leo, you would agree that in a case like Nike, where they have a clear purpose, they've decided, they've told their shareholders, they've told everybody, this is what we stand for. You don't like our position on this football player and kneeling? Fine, take your money elsewhere. I think, Larry, I think you raise a very good point, but I think when a company has a clear purpose and its shareholders and its board buy in, Leo, would you disagree in that limited case, it might make sense? Well, sure, and I think well, it's another thing to say, we don't have a position on, on like generally we think people have different views. That's another thing to employ someone, for example, to sell a sneaker for you or a branded sneaker. And then the person engage in speech as also recently happened with the sneakers situation, engage in a speech that, you know, is discriminatory and, and hurtful. You want to, as a business need to be associated with that, obviously, for example, someone like Bill Cosby, who was beloved by Americans for many years, has had a lot fewer <laughs> commercial opportunities since certain aspects of his life came um, to the fore. And, and I, I, I think what we're all saying, again, I even say in my articles, I don't think companies 
are are forbidden at all from taking positions. I just think they should be doing them largely where it affects the business themselves, that they should be judging themselves primarily, Bruce, by how they affect others. And that if they're going to act, they need to have the full board involved, that in things like getting involved in politics itself, like political donations or boycotts, I actually think they should have to be going to their stockholders and seeking assent so that there's actually a consensus behind them. And I think that will tend to concentrate companies where they should be. And I also say it has the most positive impact on society because I think we would all agree what would reduce divisiveness the most in the society would be to reduce the economic insecurity and growing inequality that many Americans fear and and, and feel and fear. And that lives gives rise to being susceptible to divisive appeals. If they could, if every company would concentrate all of its efforts and political donations and put them in the wages, then, then there would be a lot less divisiveness in society because people would be feeling good that they could pay their bills and that their kids would have a better life. Well, so Larry, there's a headline here today. Gentlemen, I've been studying this field for a long time, probably, I mean, more than anybody else, simply I'm, you know, because nobody else cares. Leo, the big news here today is that the major opposition, ironically, from the extreme, we've just published an article about this, word for word, the opposition to stakeholder capitalism, ironically, is saying that it is distracting CEOs to invest in things contrary to the needs of shareholders. Well, I think we can safely argue that that's a very ironic accusation because it's coming from the people that actually do that. Every single day, the biggest cont contributors to politics uh, are generally corporations, generally, tell me if I'm wrong, leaning toward right-wing oriented organizations. And I'm nonpartisan. Many of my friends are right-wing. But um, the bottom line is, I, I, you're, the headline here today, folks, is no, stakeholder capitalism, and Larry, you've been following this a long time, is not, it has nothing to do with CEOs getting involved with politics, Leo has said it beautifully. They're, they're entitled to their own opinions, CEOs, but their welfare is for their employees and their stakeholders and their shareholders. And unless they get approval from this board, uh, Larry, I think he's making great sentence. The headline here, stay out of politics. Do you want to- Yeah, no, I wasn't advocating. Uh, I was trying to talk about the motive, as I said, from the, from the get-go, whether it was ill-considered is another story. Well, my sense, I was trying to articulate what I thought were some of the motivations. But can I throw in sort of from left field, no political connotation? I'm free associating. I was reading this article. Who's the uh, returning CEO of uh, Starbucks? I don't remember his name. Howard, Howard Schultz. Schultz. And I was reading this long article about, about Schultz's re return and his response. Uh, and, and my reading, this article is a response to, uh, to that. It basically, is a full court anti-union press. Uh, let's say, arguably stretching the limits of labor law or perhaps going beyond that. Uh, and the article characterized him as basically his self-conception. I've, I've been good to, I created this company and I've been really good to my the, these workers. It's my company and I've been good to, to these workers and some or other, they've got it wrong and, and what have you. Or, and with that mindset from the start, uh, responds dramatically. Uh, I'm not saying he has to end up pro-union because I'm harking back to the question you raised. Doesn't everybody get it about stakeholder ha capitalism in the better sense that you've described it? And the question is whether institutionally or culturally, that's what I mean by what's in people's heads, how they think about the world. How do you create openness a, to thinking about doing things differently and literally being able to take the steps to do something differently. And all I'm saying is, if we have Starbucks, I'm not saying, are there other modalities for the voice? I mean, the issues at Starbucks, I think are twofold. There are issues, are, there are issues about scheduling wages and so on, but there's questions of dignity, of respect, which spill over into broader notions of voice. So they're both things and they're, and they're interrelated. All I'm saying I mean, is- as, as you know, Larry, there, I have one very simple idea, but I think, and which I think it would be sensible and achievable, which is we have mandated under federal law, we actually have federal law going into what's usually a state law thing of corporate law, 
we've mandated that there be a committee of the board called the compensation committee that focuses on C-suite compensation. And, but we have no mandate for any committee to focus on the workforce writ large. At many companies, I believe the boards actually don't have an adequate appreciation of what their workforce looks like top to bottom in terms of how they're paid, how they use contracted workers. There's no home at the board level for discussions of things like uh, like um, discrimination, Me Too. And so one incremental idea, honestly, which I think also deals with the issue of a CEO just making all these decisions, is to turn the compensation committee into a workforce committee, have it have to situate executive pay within the context of a, a full plan to motivate the company's workforce. That's actually good for business because I always point out $5 million to the C-suite is $5,000, $1,000 bonus checks. And what kind of motivation would you get in terms of the company, in terms of the distribution, if you were thinking about it that way? And I think that would be one thing that a lot of Americans would support given the inequality. I think the boards would make a better decision. And how does it relate to Mr. Schultz? I don't want to fault Mr. Schultz, but it is a little odd that a guy who ran on the left in the Democratic primary feels so strongly against unions, but it's not unusual in history, right? There have been a lot of people like who they believe that what they're doing is good for the people over whom they're exercising power. Part of what you're adverting to, Larry, is the relative lack of voice, Bruce, and this is a real thing in, thing in the United States, for any other stakeholder in the system. And as we've made stockholders in the form of institutional investors more powerful, it's been harder and harder for workers to have any voice. And I think this workforce committee, Larry, might be a way to actually start to build on that. And one of my ideas was to give them, Bruce, the ability to experiment with, with worker voice, even at non-union companies, as long as they're not trying to stifle unionization. And I also think the board, not a CEO, should be determining a company's policy about unions. I will couple this, though, with the other thing. Getting corporations out of the political process is hugely helpful to other stakeholders. Corporate money tends to be a, on, against environmental protection, against worker rights. If we let human beings be the ones who determine the politics, then you're probably going to get outcomes out of the political system that are a little bit more balanced than we've gotten to, Larry. So those are two practical things. And by the way, the institutional investors have the power to get rid of corporate political spending, Bruce. They got rid of classified boards in less than 10 years. Our uh, friend of Larry and I's from Harvard, Lucian Bebchuk, led a thing. And within 10 years, classified boards were gone. They get what they want. And if they want to shut down corporate political spending, even the U.S. Supreme Court can't do anything about it because if the stockholders themselves say you shouldn't spend money on politics without our approval, even the even the current Supreme Court really can't interfere with that. Leo, I'm sorry. I'm a newsman. And this is really a breaking story to really because you are this really settles it for me an issue. Uh, and by the way, Larry, you mentioned feudalism. It's no coincidence. Leo, that, that, not me. That, I did. I did. I, I, I mean, I just, but I, I was, I have, my ancestry kind of com said I came all from serfs. Well, you mentioned free feudalism, <laughs> and I am sorry, capitalism is a direct evolution of feudalism, and I am I, not kidding. History is my hobby. You can trace it. All of the dynamics of feudalism live. We still have kings. We still have queens. We have dukes. We have serfs. It's all, we have mergers and acquisitions, marriages between interlocking boards. It's all there. It's just private capital now, more democratic. But you've been a big advocate, and boy, we're running out of time. For, so, gentlemen, if I cut you off a little bit, it's not, I could stay all day with you guys. But you've been a big advocate for the E of ES of E. In fact, you've been, I read that you, it should be EESG almost. Could you explain, uh, you've already kind of done that already, but let's spend a minute on that. Larry, get your view as well. I, I mean, where I was told, I, I, I think the people most important to capitalism success are the workers. That's, and, but if you, if you look at the thing, it really was, workers within the ESG movement have been entirely subordinate. And Bruce, I was told where I could find them. 
and this was aptly put, that they were buried in the S. And I believe that the E in, for environment will not go forward without the E in employees. History shows, for example, that if it's a choice between making your current living to feed your family and the environment, the current living wins out. And if we want to make progress in, in, in on climate, for example, we got to bring along the workers in the energy industry who have labored hard to help us keep warm in winter and cool in the summer. And if you look at the biggest corrosion, the biggest injury that's happened to societal stability has been the change in gain sharing between workers and stockholders. And if you look at the share of the, 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 the profits that now goes to workers in comparison to what would have been the case in the 1960s and 1970s, a huge part of the inequality gap that has grown is simply because of that change in gain sharing. It's not, there's been much more profit and much more productivity, but the share of it that the workers would have gotten in the past has gone down and the distributional effects of that are negative because even though we've democratized to some extent the stockholder class, the reality is on average stockholders are way wealthier than the typical worker. And also we've hurt black people you know, disproportionately because they only got labor rights in the middle of the 1960s and inequality as imperfect as the new deal was in terms of its treatment of black people it did improve the lot of black people the great society improved it more and but then when the reagan revolution came in and when stockholders got much more powerful this shift particularly hurt black people and so one of the best ways that we can actually produce social harmony is to restore fair gain sharing with workers because that will disproportionately help people on the bottom of the ladder that will help close the inequality gap that has grown since reagan was in power and it will help if you think about bruce what we were talking about the the kind of attacks on esg and where they come from many of them come from elected officials who represent struggling white communities that are struggling with the same economic insecurity and I don't think that's coincidental. And I think that if you improve the lot of, of the many and you in, improve economic security, that's going to bring us more together. And that's why I emphasize, and I've been toying with it called ESG or double ESG, maybe catchier, I, it, but we cannot lose sight of the workers. And frankly, the big institutional investors still don't talk much about living wage. They didn't really talk about racial equality until George Floyd. And and there's a gap there. And I think if we, have we a lose question. sight of that. We yeah. have a question I'm gonna ask you related to this, but you know, uh, I will say, uh, Leo, frankly, I think the big problem in this country is that we are just as racist against poor white people as we are. I grew up in a very, we are against blacks. I grew up- Oh, sure, we have a class system. I mean, we, we have a every class, class system. But the Republicans or some people have figured out that if the blacks, poor whites and the poor blacks ever figure out that they're both discriminated against equally and that they're being played off against one another, that will change politics. But we have a question. Should pension dollars from communities of color and unions be invested in corporations that don't support workers' rights and which are used against their interests? I think it's a fair question. I mean, I think that you know, I think there are, are ways um, to do responsible investment consistent with value that still get the benefits of prudent diversification. And I would say this, Bruce, nobody asked when a pension fund invests in a typical actively traded mutual fund, which has average turnover of 300 percent and where by definition of all that is known about corporate finance, the expenses and risk are likely to underperform the market. A responsible approach uh, to ESG investing, where again, what you're saying is, Bruce, we're gonna invest in the companies that make money the right way because our pensioners are long-term and other people. And honestly, we wanna invest in them because we think over time, that's what's gonna produce the most wealth. And be, by the way, we're workers. I think that's a totally prudent approach you can't invest in just five companies because that, as we know, that's crazy. 
but you can create a bad, a, a, a broad enough basket of what you think of are, as, as I'll say, companies that make money the right way. And that includes, in my view, respectfully treating your workers that I don't see why, why that's at all a problem for, for pension funds. It, and, and, and I think it's perfectly appropriate. Larry, your point of view. I comment on that uh, fast reprise. I wrote a paper called Paradigm Lost, which is a critique of ERISA from, from the get-go, the fiduciary duty standard, which I found problematic, that I think it was the wrong construct from the get-go and, and too narrow, too narrow a construct. A. Uh, B, in reality, I mean, there uh, you're talking about DB plans, to, to find benefit plans at the time, right? It, Nothing like the, the DC plans as such didn't exist in the sense that we're talking about them today. All right. Uh, holding aside the, the problems with the, with, I said, the, the very model that they, const they, they constructed, which in effect is the basis for the restrictions about how those monies can be invested. In that paper, I argued DC plans are different. Okay. In a way, almost by definition, you have a, but a fiduciary in the sense of someone literally acting in your name, a DC plan in not only is different under American law, that Divine is contract, the company, contribution. you make the choices of the investments within the menu the 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 uh, the trustees construct, okay? But normally it's partially a choice-based model. And the question I raise is why within that choice-based model and the, and the rationale for that, isn't there space, shouldn't there be legal space for that? Second, and in a way related point, because uh, I checked these figures yesterday of the, uh, whatever it is, $27 trillion in retirement assets. I think that's what it is. 11 trillion are in individual retirement accounts. B, a large fraction of the money in individual retirement accounts are rollovers from- 401k. Fine contribution. Okay. And IRAs, our retirement monies, which nominally, nominally, there's no fiduciary duty in it in the sense that I'm referring to it. No one's making the decision for you. I can invest in basically anything I want. So it seems to me there's something wrong with I'll call it the I, I think what's happened here, it's a, it's a symptom of the larger politicization of this space. And my point in pointing to something like actively traded mutual funds or active parts of pension funds or pension funds that have gone long particular sectors like gold or silver at certain times is, there's a lot of things that you can do to seek money that maybe there's, that are far more deviant from um, principles of good investing than deciding that we wanna create a large basket of, of companies that we think are socially responsible, that treat their stakeholders right, and that really make profits net of externalities, especially because we're holding a broad basket of companies and, and our, our investors are workers and taxpayers and consumers, and they eat those in, in things. I think it's because it's become politicized, Larry, that we're having these discussions. And I think that there's an awful lot about pension funds in terms of return chasing that's hurt workers. Like they're not funded, so they go into the hedge fund space. Very few people have been hurt by ESG funds. And I also point out it's often, it's not the case that everything you invest in is supposed to get the maximum return. People have to have a blend, right? And, and economies, you balance risk. People used to invest in public utility stocks, right? Because they were steady uh, parts of the thing. And so I think it's just a symptom of the larger fact that, that this fractiousness and divisiveness in our society invades every space of discussion that it's now become a, 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 a talking point within things like ERISA. Gentlemen, we gotta move on on tight space. Um, uh, we have so much to cover, we're not gonna be able to cover, but there is breaking news. And I wonder, we need to get Larry here, a, le a legal minds view of this. The European <laughs> Union uh, has just come out with something that has been talked about in the United States for 20 years. Um, and that is requiring companies that are considered to have a significant impact on society to disclose significant information on their stakeholders. And there are four parts to that. And, and Leo, I want to really ask you about this, because I think when America, this hasn't been covered anywhere yet. I think 
the lawyers are covering it, as you know, <laughs> everybody at Wachtell knows about this. That is for sure. Sure, uh, Martin Lipton does. Uh, but um, but beyond that, no one is not in the New York Times, not in the Wall Street Journal, not in the National Union, that U.S. companies that do business in Europe that have 250 more employees there or which do business with them will have to disclose how they treat in great detail not only their own workforce, but the workforce of their supply chain and their consumers. And by the way, gentlemen, I think customers should have a seat on the board as well. That's another story. But um, but also their supply chain and distribution partners. And uh, Leo, one of the things, and it's buried there, it's not a headline. You have to read the fine print. Turnover. Employee turnover. Now, a lot of questions on demographics, age, diversity. But turnover is buried in there. U.S. companies do not like to disclose that. Is that legal? Can can the European, who could, I mean, on paper, Cooley, one of the top attorneys in this area, as and they, I don't, lawyers usually don't exaggerate. They have specifically said this is groundbreaking new disclosures of a non-financial nature that is never done before. And they called it groundbreaking. Do you view it that way or? I, I mean, I, I think it's, look, as someone, and I confess, I've been calling for the U.S. to have more disclosure about workforce well-being myself. So I generally am, am in favor of this. I don't think it's groundbreaking in this sense. It may be groundbreaking on the labor worker front. Uh, com companies that do business within the borders of nations are historically subject to regulation about how they affect people, right? If you if you operate a plant somewhere, you're subject to that country's minimum wage laws, its worker safety laws, its environmental laws. So to the extent that this is saying you're a U.S. company, you hit these thresholds, you have to disclose information about your operations within the EU. I, I think that is pretty conventional. There may be some questions if they start trying to get outside the EU about your, you know, but within the EU, no. And in fact, what's what's been outdated about our system and for a long time, Bruce, is that we rely on the whether you're a public company or not to determine whether you have to disclose things to society. And there are many, many private companies way larger than certain public companies. And we don't have a disclosure regime for them about how they treat their other stakeholders. And the EU is increasingly stepping up on these things. And one thing I've tried to argue to American policymakers is we live in a world economy. And if the US and the US business sector wants to participate as leaders you can't pretend that we don't and that we actually have done better, Bruce, when we take um, stock of a fairly worldwide interest in certain things and, and have created a U.S. model that then becomes the model for the world. What we risk on things like climate and on workers is basically having U.S. companies have to adhere de facto to a standard set outside our border because we're, our political process is so broken that we can't make progress sensibly on issues that where in other of our capitalist competitors can. Well, and it's interesting at the brass, at the brass level, I already know this is happening. If you want to do business with a European company in this country, you're going to have to fill that out. Yeah, you can go to your lawyer and say, I'm not going to fill it out. And Audi can say to you, well, adios, we'll find another vendor. This is what happened with ISO 9001 quality standards. It wasn't the government. Those are voluntary standards. But when GM and Ford and Chrysler at the time adopted them, you wanted to do business with them. So, Larry, I do think that this will have the effect of law from a competitive standpoint, only from the standpoint that I know companies that are already told me they're going to comply. Uh, so, so Larry, I mean, no, uh, I, I go ahead, Larry. Just, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, this, uh, I mean, the, the, I mean, one is the issue, the, the reach of of these provisions. The second is the content, and it, it seems to me there are, I mean, the the discourse about disclosure here under the SEC rubric is under under a, uh, a materiality standard. Mater materiality is relate putatively relates to financial company financial performance. But if I understand correctly, the standard to which you're referring involves disclosure not only with regard to that, but also with regard to the impact on the particular stakeholder. 
that's a very that, yeah, and we, that's a very different. Well, and that's what I'm saying is that the e, the EU has a different approach, Larry. They have stakeholder based disclosure systems that don't. They're not just based on whether you have publicly listed shares. They want disclosure of things that matter to society and particular stakeholders. We're having trouble in the U.S. because we've always piggybacked off of the SEC process. And so you can have comparably you know, a much larger private company that discloses no information about their workers, um, nothing really about their environmental compliance. They may, they may report to the EPA, but that may not be a public report. And the EU, I think, much more straightforwardly says, we care about the environment because it matters to everybody. And whether you have shares or not that are tr publicly traded, if you have a certain amount of impact on the environment of workers, you're going to have to report. And and they're going ahead with this, as Bruce said. And the other thing, Bruce, is this chimes with a lot of what the leading investors are wanting, because investors are also wanting to know what they're buying into. And it's nice for members of Congress and, and state treasurers to say that investors shouldn't care about things. But you know, like I, I work with a company and and, and they're they're a, a reinsurer and they reinsure uh, disaster and storm risk. They kind of have a very core fiduciary business reason why they have to think about climate risk. And for a lot of investors, they, they view these things as actual real business metrics. And because they're holding risk for more than a year, they realize that companies that have large externality risk can pose real problems for them as investors. Well, and we're getting right to the end and we don't, you know, by the way, you're a creator uh, or an early advocate of the Public Benefits Corporation. Um, and, you know, we that, we could do a whole program on that. And but you should and do it with the people from B-Lab and they can tell you about it. And it's a growing movement. And again, there's no single solution, Bruce. We're not the Soviet Union, right? Uh, I, I tend my heroes tend to be people like Roosevelt, Orwell, uh, people who do things do things that improve society. Martin Luther King don't try to be totalitarians; they try to do things. The Public Benefit Corporation puts some teeth within the American system behind stakeholders. There's some uh, uh, emerging interest among them in public companies, and and so it's a promising but not perfect development. And but that's the kind of thing we need to nurture, and it'd be a great program. And to, to have a, in and of itself and deserves well, that. And for our listeners to know public benefit, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but they're essentially a, 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 a means of a corporation to have a cause, to have a, a clear cause, disclose that cause and can still pay dividends. So and even the, more, Bruce, in Delaware, it's a bad name because it sounds like some sort of welfare corporation. Yeah. No, it's a bad name. I've told the people joining. It really means what we've said. In Delaware, you can have a purpose. You have it's a for-profit. You still have a duty to your stockholders, but you have a duty to all your stakeholders. And you have to make money in a way that's respectful for your other stakeholders. And even when you sell the company, that duty persists. And for many directors and many people, when you have a shall duty, people take that seriously. And there's some enforceability behind it. And as I said, it's not a perfect solution. But it does align really the duties that the board has and the people around the company with what we've been talking about, about what's in the best interest of society uh, uh, long term and for best for all of us. And so it, it would be worthy for your, your good listeners and people who follow it to actually have a sustained uh, program on it. But I view well, it as, as, as a hopeful development. Well, and so the last question we're going to go over one minute. Uh, and Larry, I'm, this is, uh, I guess, for our attorney here. Um, could I? Okay, we all know under corporate law, you have a very prominent jurist. So well, I know I, I can't I, I wear a robe. Well, I can, you know. Otherwise, I don't it's wear a robe anymore. An hour, you know. Um, the uh, the question is uh, very simple. Um, you know that a corporation, a C corp, the only people who can vote are the shareholders. It's flat out. The consumers have no vote. Nobody else has any vote at all unless the corporation makes otherwise moves. And obviously, people like Carl Icahn have come along over the years and they've said, hey, uh, they bought a bunch of shares and said, I'm going to help you create more value. Well, I'm going to postulate this. I would say about 80% of public companies 
are leaving 10 to 15% of profits on the table by pissing off customers, pissing off employees, just like they did in quality management. And I could prove it. And I have colleagues of mine who have expertise in this who could prove it. Or, or could we see a day in this new era when people actually do care that the stadiums built for the, the for the cutter games were built by on the sweat and backs of of not very nicely treated people? Are we coming to the day where we may start activist shareholders, millennial shareholders? They have the right to go in and say, hey, you're leaving money on the table. We want new CEOs. We want people who are going to value people. Could we see that legally? Could we see that culturally? I, I think what I have long called for, and it may not be, I have very strong feelings about the cut, Cutter World Cup, which was taken from us and then and, 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 and improperly. And a lot of Americans, unfortunately, took money from that bid. And some of them would sh surprise you. Uh, I think what you're saying is one of the points I've been trying to make for the entire century is this. The companies can only be as good as the investors who control them. And the investors who control the big companies have other people's money and their institutional investors and they are fiduciaries. And they need to think in the way that Bruce, you've been talking about that they need to think about wealth creation, net of externalities, and realizing that their investors invest in debt and not just equity, that their investors pay taxes, and that their investors depend on their jobs, and that if we want the most wealth creation for those investors, then the institutions who control the vote and everything have to be encouraging and supporting companies and making money the right way. It's not enough to go to one meeting and, and support a company over climate change. You have to be there on the full journey. There's going to be bad years when a company has a down market and they have to struggle through it. And that's when the investors most need to support the companies in continuing to try to focus on doing things the right way. And so I think uh, the good Adolf, a guy named Adolf Burley, uh, had the point that anyone who has economic power should have economic responsibility. He was one of Roosevelt's brain trusters. And we have too long left the institutional investors off the hook. That's why I applaud, not denigrate the efforts of the index funds to step up and to speak out. And I think we need to support them. And we think we need to encourage them to go further. And, and if they can do things, for example, like restrict corporate political spending, is support companies in treating workers the right way, then we have a better likelihood of having good outcomes and we need them to do it increasingly internationally. You Are you an optimist? Is it, are we moving toward a stakeholder capitalist society? I, I am not, I don't, I, I, I know I, my view is you never stop trying. And one of the things I think that we need to remember is that we don't need new thinking we need to remember successful thinking and we need to reinvigorate our commitment to things like the economy has to work for everybody, that you can't despoil the environment in which you live and be healthy. People forget that foggy London was not fog, it was pollution and it was cured in the 20th century. And, but that the pace of history moves faster. And, one of Franklin Roosevelt's dreams, if you look at his last speeches, some of his last speeches in 1944, was that the principles of the New Deal would be globalized. And in a, a very important way, that was accomplished throughout the OECD nations. And that's why there was so much shared prosperity in them. We need to remember that that vision is the right vision. And we need to do what we can, across, hands across the border and in our own society, to live up to those ideals and then to bring them to developing regions with regionally appropriate living wages, regionally appropriate standards so that we all are, we include more and more humanity in the blessings of a market system that does things the right way. And I, I don't know whether I'm optimistic or not, but it seems to me that's the cause to which we need to, to commit ourselves. And if we do that, um, frankly, we're all gonna be better off and therefore, we're gonna be more like the big family at Thanksgiving. We may not agree on everything, but we can enjoy the game together and, and realize that the ties that bind us are a lot more important than the differences between us. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Larry, thank you as well. And I think 
Um, the, the one thing I gives me hope, you know, the great father of uh, share, not the father, but a huge advocate of shareholder capitalism when I was very young was a man named Michael Jensen from Harvard. And he was uh, he was on the big speaking circuit and he, you know, he was the big guy. He wasn't greed as good. That's not fair. But well, anyway, um, he was recently on a movie called Fishing with Dynamite. And there is a fabulous little video clip of him. Larry, you may have uh, he's a neighbor of yours up there. Uh, he says stake shareholder capitalism is stupid. Stop it. And only from Michael Jensen could anybody say that. So thank you, uh, gentlemen, so much. Thank for you, Bruce. Time. Thank you, Larry. Great to be with you guys. Take care. Okay, uh, but uh, please hold with me here. Uh, 